This morning, um, I get to read the words uh, from uh, Mark, chapter 10, 17 through 22. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. And honor your mother and father. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all of these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at that statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. So let us pray together. God of justice and mercy, fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit that we might hear, and in hearing we might believe, and in believing that we might act, making way for your new creation. Amen. Well, there's a legend about a rich man who visited a rabbi. And the rabbi took the rich man by the hand and he led him to a window and he said, look out the window, what do you see? And the rich man said, well, I see women and men and children. Okay, and the rabbi said, well, now come to this mirror. And so the rabbi led the rich man to a mirror and he said, look in the mirror, now what do you see? And the rich man said, why, I see myself. And the rabbi said, yeah, in the window there is glass and in the mirror there is glass. But the glass of the mirror is covered with silver. No sooner is the silver added than you cease to see others and you only see yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, we have another letter from John Wesley. He visited us a couple of weeks ago and he's been writing to us since then. So we have a letter from him. To God's beloved sons and daughters in Lake of the Pines, Alta Sierra, North Auburn, and Grass Valley, California. I guess that's us. <laughs> I'm writing to you all again to explain the last part of my threefold statement on the use of money. This week, I want to tell you to give all you can. I've already written to you about earning all you can, but not to do so in ways that would diminish yourself the lives of others, or the integrity of God's creation. In my last letter, I shared with you an event in my life that profoundly changed the way that I thought about spending money. When I just frivolously spent my paycheck and had nothing left to help the poor chambermaid who came to clean my room, I was so ashamed. That grace-filled moment led me to reorganize my life and to always think carefully about what I needed as opposed to what I wanted. And so, as I told you, save all you can. But there's a third rule, and that's the rule that gives meaning to the other two, which is what this letter is all about today. Let me share with you what I preached on this back in 1760 in my sermon on the use of money. I said this, if you stop at gaining and saving all you can, then it's nothing if you do not go forward. You cannot properly save anything if all you do is lay it up. You may as well throw your money in the sea or bury it in the earth. Not to use it is to effectively throw it away. You need to add a third rule to the two preceding. Having first gained all you can, and secondly, saved all you can, then give all you can. So first, you should provide things that you need for yourself, food and clothes and things to preserve your health and strength. Then, provide these two for your spouse, your children, servants, and others in the household. Thirdly, do good to those of the household faith, and fourth, do good to all men. If you have doubts about expenditures, ask yourself if you are acting as a steward. 
Look at what the scripture says and examine your conscience. Render unto God not a tenth, not a third, not a half, but all that is God's. By employing all on yourself, on your household, the household of faith, and all mankind, in such a manner that you can give a good account of your stewardship later. Well, that's what I said in that sermon. If I follow this way of living, then by giving all I can, I'm effectively secured from laying up treasures on earth. I'm secured from either desiring or endeavouring as long as I give all I can. I believe that excessive wealth, absence of effective stewardship and radical charity prevents you from growing in grace and creates sinful attitudes and actions. Stewardship that centers on the poor is a means of grace. I used to tell people that if I die with more than 10 pounds in my possession, then I would consider myself to be a thief. I also directed my friends that after my funeral service, they are to take down the draperies used for my service and sew them into clothing for poor women. Now giving all you can is not intended to be a hardship, it's to be a source of joy. So earn all you can, save all you can, but then remember to give all you can. Yours in Christ, John Wesley. Well, Wesley's advice, his giving standard, is radical, inspiring, and deeply frightening to many. It's the same thing as Jesus told the rich man in the scripture we read, and it frightened him too. So listen to this story now told by Susan Andrews. A husband and a wife were traveling around the world, and they were in Korea. And they saw a man ploughing a field. He was standing behind the plough. But in front of him, a boy, not a horse, not an ox, but a boy, was pulling the plough. So the tourist husband took a photo and later showed it to the missionary, who was their guide and their interpreter. And he was told that when the local church was being built, the family wanted to give something. But they hadn't got <coughs> any money. So they sold their ox, the only ox that they had, and they gave the money to the church. And so this spring, they were plowing the field themselves. The tourist husband and wife were silent. The wife said, wow, that was a real sacrifice. Oh, they didn't call it that, said the missionary. They thought it was fortunate that they had an ox to sell. I call this sermon philanthropic advice, which is to do with the humanitarian distribution of our assets and generosity with our wealth. And that's partly what Wesley was talking about. But in his threefold formula, he's also talking about stewardship, about managing the resources of another. We are all God's stewards. It's not just about us. We've been placed in a role of great trust and responsibility for the earth and all of creation. God owns everything, and we are invited to be in the world, not just as recipients, but as stewards, as a means of grace towards others. We become more like Christ as we practice the spiritual discipline of generosity. And as we become generous people, our lives are shaped in the image of an extravagantly generous God. Wesley understood this. His rules were not about fundraising for the church, nor about making us feel bad. Wesley saw generosity as a spiritual issue, as a way of having a right relationship with money, as a way to look at the glass and see through it, rather than seeing only our own reflection. And yes, you will soon be receiving a letter asking you to think about your pledges to the church in the upcoming year. 
so that we can plan together for the mission of this church. I'm glad that we were able to listen to Wesley's words this morning. The thing that makes the difference between Wesley preaching this to you and me preaching this to you is that Wesley actually lived it out to the letter. When he began as a preacher, he was poor, and most of his salary went to supply basic needs. He was only able to give away a couple of pounds a month. But as his income grew, the amount he spent on living expenses never grew. All the extra income he received, he gave away. And that grew to be quite substantial. Because he was living only on what he needed. All the money that rolled in from his publishing and other efforts went to start hospitals and orphanages and women's work cooperatives. Wesley practiced what he preached. When he earned £1,400 a year, he kept £30 of it for himself and gave the rest away. That means he kept 2% and gave away 98%. Wouldn't that be something for our politicians to think about? <laughs> well into his 80s, Wesley brought meals to widows, trampling through the slush and snow in worn boots with holes in them. That gave him the pneumonia that finally ended his life. To the very end, he earned all he could. He saved back every penny that wasn't necessary and he gave back every bit of what he saved up for the work of God's kingdom. In 1791, he was carried to his grave by six paupers, who were each paid one pound each, which was all he had left. That's why I let John Wesley preach this sermon. Now, Wesley should have spent something on new boots to walk through the snow. If he had followed his own advice, he would have taken care of his own basic needs. But even Wesley was fallible. I know my own life is still too cluttered with things that I don't need for me to preach this message with total integrity. And yet I know he's right. We're on a journey of faith together. And yes, I do try to live into it. We each have to wrestle with what it means in today's society when we do need to save. We need money for our children's college education. We need money to live on in retirement. But we all need to wrestle with what is a want versus what is a need. Where do smart watches come in? How often do we eat out at a restaurant? Well, some years ago, Adrian and I were sitting where you are sitting now in the pews listening to a pastor preach on tithing, which is also a biblical principle of giving away a tenth of what you earn. And as we thought about our pledge that year, and we thought we were already being generous, we calculated what it was as a percentage of our income. I think we were at about 5% at that point, and we sat down and did some soul searching. How could we get to give a biblical 10%? And we worked our way up gradually, 1% at a time, until we were giving away 10% of our income. And then we heard someone preach, or oh, maybe you're supposed to do what Wesley says, give all you can. And we've carried on giving, we're at about 12% now of what we give away to others. And then we started to think about how we spend our money. Is it a need or is it a want? When we changed cars for me a few years back, we have two cars, one for him to get to work and one for me to go around town in. And we were looking at what we should get for me for a new car. Um, we were looking at brand new cars for a while and what that was going to cost and how much it would cost us, how much we could have to come out of our savings. And we kind of thought in the end, this is crazy. We don't need a new car. And so we went and we got a used car. The car I have does not open with a clicker. You have to use the key to open it. And if you want to get open the window, you have to wind it down. 
1965. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Anne Frank, 1929 to 1945. No one has ever become poor by giving. And John Wesley, 1703 to 1791. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Oh God, we confess that often we earn all we can and save all we can, but we forget the giving bit. We forget that everything in heaven and on earth is yours. We forget your love for everything that lives, moves, and has been. We forget who we are, your beloved stewards. Help us to remember so that our lives may be abundantly living channels of your steadfast love poured out for all. Pour your grace on us as we live into Wesley's wise words to earn and save and give all we can. <laughs> 